And we're joined now by the Republican chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, Texas Congressman Michael McCall. Good to have you here in person this morning. Thanks for having me, Margaret. Um, Chair McCall, this attack in Moscow was carried out by ISIS-K, uh, a group that typically uh, emanates out of Afghanistan. We know the U.S. had advanced warning. From what you know, is there an ongoing threat in Eurasia, and are U.S. interests a target? Yeah, I, I believe so. I think that the, the uh, sitcom commander, General Carrillo, just testified this week before Congress that within six months that ISIS-K would have the capability to, to uh, operate outside of Afghanistan, to do external operations, and it only took six days before they hit Moscow. Uh, or outside of Moscow. And I think uh, Europe is of concern. And it's, it's sort of like we're going back to that old playbook where history repeats itself. And that's why the fall of Afghanistan, the way it was done, and the way we left it with no ISR capability, that intelligence, surveillance, or cognizance, puts us in danger uh, where this is a new battleground, training ground for ISIS. Well, the U.S. did, though have some ears on this if they warned Russia, right, Correct. that ISIS was um, a threat here. You in your committee, you have been very focused on Afghanistan, and you held a hearing with the retired generals Mark Milley and Frank McKenzie this past week. They both said the State Department failed to adequately plan for the withdrawal from an ev evacuation from Afghanistan. Given the threat environment the U.S. is facing right now on multiple continents at once, Haiti, Niger, all the Middle East, are you confident that the United States government is prepared to protect its people in all of those posts and carry out evacuations if needed? I'm very concerned. I think what happened in Haiti, our embassy is under a threat right now. We're starting to evacuate them. Uh, you know, what happened in Afghanistan, the generals are very clear. Uh, it wasn't the DOD, it was the State Department that never came up with a plan of ev evacuation, which by law they're required to do. And so what happened if you-, you Well, they said it was too late when it was put into place. It, there was it, a plan, but it was too and late. And it was put in place, but only at the time that Kabul was falling and the embassy was starting to be evacuated. I think what the State Department thought they could do is continue our operations in the embassy and normalize with the Taliban and stay there beyond uh, the military retrograde. And I think that was a serious error in judgment. And Ambassador Wilson was a major culprit behind that, including all the way up to the White House. Well, the State Department has pointed out that the Trump administration that brokered the deal for withdrawal could have planned for an evacuation and did not. What do you make of that? Yeah, they're they they, they they're by law required to plan. I think DOD was starting to pick up the slack. You know, we saw the threats coming in, the threat vectors. The IC was telling us it was going to fall fast. The DOD knew this. And the State Department seemed to have these rose-colored lenses on. When you listen to the White House, you know, press comments about how it's not going to be like Vietnam, uh, everything's fine, and it wasn't. That's why we had the dissent cable come out from the embassy, 23 employees, a cry for help, screaming to get out of there because they knew what was going to happen. The government funding bill that was signed last night, um, 12,000 additional special visas to Afghan nationals who had worked with the U.S. were tucked into this funding bill. What more needs to be done to help the Afghan allies who worked alongside the U.S.? Well, we promised them we would get them out. The Afghan partners, the interpreters, we left them behind. And that's the biggest sin of the Afghan evacuation. I think the 12,000 SIVs is, is a great response and a great start to that. I will commend uh, Speaker Johnson. I worked very closely with him to make sure we had that in there because mm -hmm. on one hand, Republicans can say, my gosh, we left them behind, but then we're not going to do anything to help them yeah. get out with visas. So has Speaker Johnson given you any timeline for a vote on Ukraine aid, given that they are running out of ammunition? His commitment is to put it on the floor after Easter, and we are working on this bill. So as soon as you all come back April 9th? I would like to be done as soon as possible. I think the situation in Ukraine is dire. The front lines are, are uh, it's, uh, uh, we can't, if we lose in Ukraine, like Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and lose to Putin, let him, uh, you know, take over Ukraine and Moldova, Georgia, and abandon our allies like we did in Afghanistan, 
Does that make the United States weaker or stronger? Well, I think why, weaker. Why isn't there that sense of urgency on the speaker's part? I mean, respectfully, this has been stuck in the House for weeks. You have been warning about this. It needs to be acted on. Uh, he understands this. Uh, he uh, is in a very difficult spot. And this you know, motion to vacate the chair thing, uh, I believe he's committed because he understands national security. He leans on, you know, myself, the chairman of armed services, House Intelligence, for advice on this. And he knows how important this is. So you trust that this will be voted on? Because as you just mentioned, that motion to vacate was just introduced uh, by Marjorie Taylor Greene. This isn't an, an effort to oust him. Uh, she has put this in place. You're all headed home to your districts. You are all going to be asked about this. She's the only one so far saying she wants to oust the speaker. Will she stay the only one? You know, I think it's indicative that even Matt Gates, who is the architect of ousting McCarthy, is saying this would be a huge mistake because it could actually throw the balance of power over to Joaquin Jeffries. And I think that's one argument. I think the other argument is we don't need dysfunction right now. And with the world on fire the way don't it we is. we have dysfunction right now? Well, we do. And with the world on fire the way it is, we need to govern. And that is not just Republicans, but in a bipartisan way. Get things done for the country that's in the national security interest of the United States. This is not just Ukraine. It's Israel mm -hmm. and Indo-Pacific as well. Before I let you go, 11 aid organizations have issued a letter saying that Israel is standing in the way of aid deliveries in Gaza, their firsthand experience. Do you doubt their testimonies? I think we are having difficulties. I talked to, uh, uh, you know, Cindy McCain yesterday, World Food Program, David Beasley, her predecessor. Look. Logistics and security are the issue. Israel knows it's important to get that humanitarian assistance in uh, because for a lot of reasons. We have to stabilize southern Gaza, but they also need to go into Rafah and take out uh, Yahya Sinwar, the head of Hamas. So that's a competing interest here. Unfortunately, the ceasefire talks, I think Hamas is playing us, mm -hmm. playing. Uh, Director Burns talked to, you know, uh, uh, the Israelis. They agreed to the ratio. I don't think Hamas will. Uh, they're not playing fair. Chair McCall, thank you for your time today. Margaret, thanks for having me.